has become, in the beginning, what was sort of a gentle lead toward the future has become an irrevocable chain to the, to the, to the, the looking back to the past, something that can't, this can't be undone. So that's the, the shackle that I have. It's not sinister, it's just the idea that, one, these women after, if you, if you knew people, one of, one of the communities hit was people who worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, I remember, and talking to people who had lost husbands working that day, and they felt, you know, very much part of each other because they could hang on to each other, but very much trapped in the situation. You know, what if I had kept him home from work? What if I had done something to keep the person that was dying away? And I think that, that anybody who has lost somebody, I, I, know I, I lost a friend of mine uh, two years ago, and I keep thinking, you know, what could I have done to have saved his life? And I think that that's a really, that when something really deeply tragic happens, it's impossible not to think that. You know, just one step out the door. We hear stories at the time of the person that misses the plane, or the person that, that was late to work, or, you know, these anecdotes sort of fill us with hope, but they also make us realize that we cannot ever escape that past, and that we are always bound to each other. We are bound to each other through, um, through communities, through, through races, through ties, and she, of course, is screaming back to the past and sort of, again, out of, out of despair, but these figures are sort of resigned, holding the candle of, of hope. And one thing I always want to offer in my paintings, and, and I'll skip to the end here, and I'll, I'll retouch it again, is that I'm not a pessimistic artist. I mean, there are a lot of artists that really see the world as corrupt. And I think we look at wars, and we look at tragedies, and we really think they're corrupt. But then we can look into our neighbor's eye and see what good they're doing in the community, or see someone doing charity work, or see people like you at the museum spending your time on a, uh, on a Thursday, talking to each other, thinking about yourselves, thinking about art. And I think that glimmer of hope is something that we share as human beings that is something that is essential to the human spirit. Um, I certainly do remember, just as a funny anecdote, of, you know, to take it down a notch. Said, again, I, have, I really want you to eat these roses because I swore that I never would paint roses ever again. <laughs> I haven't painted them. But they are crazy. There were like, what I had to do, um, I wish Victoria was here today, because she was trying to paint the roses. She probably got caught in the thing, but she's one of my students, and she just, you know, just really wants me to teach her how to place roses, and it's just a masochistic thing for me, because I painted <laughs> 200 in here. And that's probably why the painting's late, because each rose requires about two days to paint. And if there's 200, you can imagine that that would have taken a lot of time. I had to buy them from California and wire them all so that they would face the right ways and then I put all kinds of props, because roses just flop. I don't know if anybody's thrown They don't just beautifully fall like Mr. America. They flop. And so I painted them and also, then I couldn't just do, you know, I had to get lots more than I did. So my whole budget from the New Britain Museum of Art that they paid me was for the <laughs> so you look at that, that's very important. And plus the models that I had to, these models I had to go back and forth, forth to, okay, well, uh, well anyway, I had to do a lot of uh, negotiating. But I, I want to go back into these sorts of, of, of things, of, and one thing I really wanted to, uh, a, a technical thing I wanted you to also notice about the paintings, I really worked hard on trying to make rhythms happen throughout the paintings, so in an abstract way, their hands related to the hands and the, these sort of swirls and this sort of uh, evident, you know, slight uh, uh, quotation of the Sistine Chapel with the fingers, you know, God and the hands coming out of the room. This, this sort of, you know, W effect for the world trade centers that I wanted to abstractly put into this rhythm of the, the figures and sort of the rhythms of the feet slightly changing colors and the rhythms of this figure, which was part of the triage. And this is where my friend Don Pitkin, uh, who again is here, is my mentor, um, and has written extensively on anthropology. I wanted him to play the role of this figure because he embodies to me wisdom and life experience, but also, the, you know, wisdom because we've gone through this whole process from youth, you know, one side to middle age to old age, which is embodying all the things that we should know. Remember, he's, he's both the person at the end that represents all the people that died, and I have sort of uh, bottles of, of medical uh, instruments and part of the doctor's thing that sort of represents all that sort of triage and taking, but also wisdom. He's supposed to have learned out of all of this tragedy, from blindness to revelation to tragedy, through terror to acceptance to 
looking back at our faith and wondering how different things could have been woven together, he's the one that's clear-eyed. His eyes are sparkling. They're staring out, you know, completely aware of all of these things that have gone on. And yet, in his hands, of all, you know, you know somebody's resuscitated with the roses and, and, and gifts, he has this ribbon again, and he's tying it back to the eyes of a youth. And it's clipped here. And it starts back over here again. Because the problem with everything that happens is that we can never, we've been through World War I and World War II and Vietnam and the Korean War and now another war and another sickness. And no matter what we do, I sound like a, a Texas preacher. I've been living in Austin, so it's like, Jesus, great. And I'm really a sinner, too. It's just bad, so I have a lot of <laughs> really bad. I like martinis, which is but not absent. That's not so good. But I wanted to, but the, the thing is, is that we don't know what is. We cannot pass the trend. We cannot pass the wisdom onto the next generation. No matter what we try to do, I am blind to what's going on. Some chain of events is going to happen. That's going to lead us through this path again, from innocence to to these things that we can't. Do and I when I when I was doing this not another thing and thinking about allegory, thinking how we read the present through the past, I also wanted the people of the future to read this through their present, to look at this. This will be past someday, and the present will be seeing this and using these symbols to relate to their world. We can look back at Wernicke and see the pain. We can look back at the Rack of Medusa and see the pain. We can look back at the tears of a Magdalene or a person you know, crying in an African mass for some kind of thing and realize that people share our experiences and even though we've gone through this and it seems insurmountable and we have people that we've lost, um, somebody's going to look back through this for solace, hopefully. And that was part of why I painted it. I painted it to not only be an emblem, but be this time capsule for some kind of identity that we have today that somebody back will look, somebody 25 years, 100 years will look back for some kind of recognition to know that their life is worth living and that the things that are happening to them are the same things that have happened to people all through history. And I think that's important. Now, I did, trust me, I've learned a lot during the picture and I've learned a lot technically. I talked a little bit about the roses. One of the things that's important is I'm very interested in humanity, so I'm very interested in flesh, and I've worked hard to, to understand you know, various procedures from stumbling, glazing, you know, masters to get in a very technical way. But I think that those things, the idea of also a classical artist is that things, that you erase all of that effort. And if there's anything that looks hard to do, I probably failed because I wanted things to look, I wanted there to be a, a transparency of craft. I wanted the brushwork to serve the painting. I wanted it to be an experience like an illusion so that what you're focusing on, what your job as an audience is, is to focus on its meaning to you. I think it's very important to look at this painting and remember, like all works of art, it is a suggestion. It's not a dictation. It's something that people, it's, it's, it's poetry, it's narrative, but it's about something that offers a piece of the puzzle in this world that's kind of crazy and tumultuous, and the world that makes us spend four years on a painting, and makes us, you know, hold hands, and makes us be a part of a museum.